Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the Graduate Institute. My name is Richard Baldwin. I'm a professor here of economics at the Graduate Institute and now director of the Center for Trade and Economic Integration. It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Ernesto Zidio. This pleasure comes in two parts. The first part is from the remarkable things that he's accomplished as a man. I won't read out his whole biography because, of course, you've come tonight to listen to him, not me. But I, I will mention that he was born into a working class background and public schooling and yet rose to do a PhD at Yale and then be elected to the highest office in his nation. The second part of this pleasure stems from the remarkable person he is and what a role model he is and should be to our students and to us all. He is a man who spent his entire life using his head and his heart to make the world a better place. During his years as president, he brought real democracy to Mexico. He overcame a massive economic crisis, and he overhauled the Mexican economy in a way that allowed it to seize the opportunities of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which had just been signed in the year he took office. He has been a personal friend and a friend of the Institute for many years, thus it is a true pleasure to welcome Professor Zedillo to the stage, actually he's on the stage, um, to the podium perhaps. And I'm looking forward to his wisdom on the topic of, a topic that's befuddling us all, the mounting challenges of global governance. Please have a hand. Thank you, Richard, for that uh, extremely generous uh, introduction. I think you overstated uh, my case, but uh, I like it. <laughs> uh, and of course, I, I thank uh, Dean Berran for his uh, invitation. Uh, well, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, extremely pleased to be again at the Graduate Institute. I was uh, very happy to be here only a few months ago with my colleagues uh, and friends uh, from the elders to attend a wonderful session where students and faculty interacted with Mary Robinson and Gro Harlem Brutland. Today, I relate uh, for the first time that my sort of uh, sentimental relationship with the Institute goes way back. Because I have always suspected that a timid aspiration of mine to apply for a postdoctoral fellowship to the Institute in 1985, which I vaguely commented to my mayors at the Central Bank of Mexico, had to do with a promotion I received a few days after my comment. So I didn't apply to the Institute, so I missed Professor Swoboda, who was one of the characters to whom I was attracted here, but became one of the deputy directors of the bank and a member of its governing board. So with more than 30 years delay, I say tonight, Thank you, Graduate Institute. <laughs> I also reiterate my gratitude for giving me the opportunity to deliver the first uh, Tate or Tate uh, lecture seven years ago, thanks to an invitation from Professor Richard Baldwin. That was exactly seven years ago, on February 24 of 2009, and that was when we were in the acute phase of uh, economic collapse brought about by the great crisis. What I want to do today is to stand by a claim I made in that lecture. And against my best instincts, I will quote myself. We could soon find ourselves regretting how little or in fact nothing states have done to improve 
the institutions created mostly in the second half of the 20th century to manage the process of global integration. For it is a fact that in the last 10 years, as globalization accelerated dramatically, the process of international reform stalled. Somehow, the Graduate Institute also gave me the chance to expand on the fear I had expressed in that uh, Tate lecture for Professor Charles, Charles Whitlow's commission, Jeffrey Frieden, Danny Roderick, Michael Petis, and myself to produce the 14th Geneva Report on the World Economy of 2012, which uh, we titled, After the Fall, the Future of Global Cooperation. That project was a fine opportunity for us, on the one hand, to once again state the case for the value and, in fact, the indispensability of international cooperation. On the other hand, unfortunately, the four co-authors also converge on, the rather, on a rather pessimistic view on the prospects of such cooperation. Our reasons of pessimism were manifold. First, we acknowledge the well-known dif difficulties inherent in the provision of any global public good. Second, we observe that even in cases where the argument for collective action has been strong, the history of cooperative efforts was not terribly encouraging. Third, we gave a special weight to Jeff Frieden's uh, domestic political economy consideration. That as a consequence of politicians' usual failure to communicate to their constituencies the benefits of international cooperation and interdependence, while exaggerating, even hysterically, the latter's potential downsides, there will be limited public support for the measures necessary to expand cooperation. In other words, and ironically, that in crisis caused partially by lack of international cooperation, domestic politics would turn against it rather than in favor of it. Of course, by the time we drafted our Geneva report, we had evidence to support our pessimism. It was not only the historical one, but also what we were living in real time back then. Consider the G20's performance. Undoubtedly, its formation at the leader's level in the fall of 2008 was excellent news. It seemed that at last the leaders of the largest economies in the world would take up the challenge of filling the economic, econ the economic governance gap. It was encouraging to learn that at their first summit meeting in November 08, the G20 leaders themselves admitted that inconsistent and insufficiently coordinated policies had led to the crisis. And on that occasion, and at two subsequent meetings, they committed to bring about that purported cooperation focused largely on reform of financial systems, preservation of open markets, reinforcement of the multilateral financial institutions, and of course, macroeconomic policy coordination. Not surprisingly, given how the crisis erupted, from its first meeting, the G20 was calling for a coordinated move towards sweeping reform in all the members' financial systems and even produce, in a noticeable display of granularity for a leader summit, a comprehensive work plan for reform, duly stressing in every part of it the importance of international cooperation. The elevation of the Financial Stability Forum to board status by virtue of expanded membership and additional responsibilities, and an agreement on the basic criteria for what eventually would come would be the Third Basel Accord, 
were early outcomes, and I'm not saying the terribly good ones, of the promised cooperation for financial reform. That impetus was short-lived. Rather soon, the key players that certainly embark on financial reforms fail to do it in the consistent, coherent, and coordinated manner that they had offered at their frequent summits during the first year of the G20's existence. Contrary to what they said, the major players went ahead unilaterally with the respective reform undertakings, as shown by the way in which the US dot franc, the Vickers inspired UK reform, and the EU reforms have proceeded, not to speak, as we are in Geneva, of the then surprising and unilateral Swiss finish on Basel III. It is tempting to say that the G20 substantially gave up its early pledge of financial reform coordination around 2010. The same can also be said about the G20's key commitment on trade the successful conclusion of the Doha round. As a response of the crisis, they aim for, and I quote, an ambitious and balanced conclusion to the Doha development round in 2010, which evidently did not happen. Under the impulse of the crisis, early on, the G20 went back to the old but repeatedly unfulfilled objective of reforming comprehensively the multilateral financial institutions. They explicitly committed to reform those institutions, mandates, scope, and governance to reflect changes in the world economy and the new challenges of glo globalization and give emerging countries greater voice and representation. They also agreed upon the allocation of larger resources to the IMF. As we know, no significant governance reform for those institutions has even been tried ever since. And it has taken an additional five years to conclude the quota review process of the IMF originally targeted to be concluded by early 2011. As we express in our Geneva report, Working seriously on macroeconomic policy coordination should be the big thing for the G20. The G20's leaders themselves seem to have had the same conviction early on. As I mentioned already, at their first summit, they rotundly declared that inconsistent and insufficiently coordinated policies had led to the crisis. Unfortunately, Almost seven years after they pledge to fix that deficiency, it is fair to say that their pledge has not been honored in any lasting way. True, there was some initial, initial coordination of fiscal policies in 2009, and central banks have done their best, albeit with alarmingly increasing difficulty, to continue providing some coherence to their respective policies but there has not been a serious attempt to evolve towards an institutional framework that would deliver the necessary effective cooperation on macroeconomic policies. The peer review process agreed at the Pittsburgh meeting of the G20, known as MAP, Mutual Assessment Process, to deal with the prevention and correction of macroeconomic imbalances, proved to be totally ineffectual and the subsequent offer to enhance the IMF's surveillance mandate and action has been left unfulfilled as well. In our 2012 Geneva report, we argued emphatically that the map was not the way to go. We said that the procedures to engage, define basic monitoring criteria, characterize each party's policies agree on each party's desirable policies and procure compliance of each party's responsibility, as contemplated in the map, did not constitute a governance framework with any significant chance of success. We observed that the map was built to provide 
the ones bearing the greatest responsibility for adjustment, multiple escape hatches from neither acknowledging or complying with that responsibility. We concluded that the map, rather than a system of peer review, look more like a system of peer complicity. At the Los Cabos G20 Summit of 2012, the MAPS profile was further downgraded by making it just an input into something then baptized as the Accountability Assessment Report, an instrument innocuous and therefore useless for any significant purpose of macroeconomic policy coordination. It is now clear that the G20 has failed, and I quote again, to ensure that our fiscal, monetary, trade, and structural policies are collectively consistent with more sustainable and balanced trajectories of growth, as they solemnly committed at their Pearswood meeting of uh, 2009. The G20 failed to endow the system with effective tools for a globally coordinated adjustment. It is thus not surprising that the crisis and its sequel have proven to be such a protract, protracted and hugely costly process. Nor is it surprising, but it is certainly regrettable, I insist, that despite the huge pain already endured, effective collective action continues to be missing. The multilateral revival that the G20 seemed to be willing to stage back in 2009 has evaporated into thin air, as proven by recent events. Just consider the brutal way in which the Doha round was euthanized by the US trade representative alone in an inelegant FT op-ed of his published on the eve of the WTO Nairobi ministerial. Just what it took an op-ed to kill Doha. Don't forget that as recently as November 2014, at the Brisbane summit, the G20 was committing, admittedly, admittedly for the end time, and therefore with nil credibility, to get the Doha negotiations back on track in order to, and I quote again, restore trust and confidence in the multilateral trading system. That was in 2014, and they kill it in 2015. Seemingly, restoring that confidence is no longer in the agenda. It is almost pathetic that not even the financial trepidations and global slowdown of the last few months have stimulated at least some talk of re-entertaining the old quest for macroeconomic policy coordination. In the face of the scary developments in global financial markets and in the real economies of the key players, it is remarkable that policies are as uncoordinated and inconsistent as they can be in normal times. And this, if you will, uh, allow me to be stubbornly repetitive, is to be regretted. I grant that the theoretical and historical case, and of course I'm looking at Professor Soboda, uh, the historical case for macroeconomic policy coordination is not crystal clear and controversial. And he, it is one point he has made very well. Opting for or against this coordination, I believe, can only rely on good judgment, informed by theory, empirical evidence, history, and an objective assessment of the existing policy predicaments. It is still my judgment that the enormous policy predicaments confronting the governments of the countries with the most significant economies, even if ultimately solving them is their own and primary responsibility, have a better chance to be addressed with considerably less pain within a framework of coordination than in a scenario of mainly unilateral and inward-looking policies.
Not even the country with the biggest economy and the chief world reserve currency, the US, can be confident that unilateral policies are in its best medium and long-term interests. However difficult, there is no alternative to essential agreement and cooperation, at least among the key players, if the outlook of a much slow growth for all in the years to come is to be improved substantially. Uncoordinated efforts by each of the key economies will give rise to the reemergence of macroeconomic imbalances, mutually inconsistent exchange rate policies, policies and ultimately beggar thy neighbor kind of situations that would lead to contention and conflict, frustrating the participants' aspirations for a stronger growth. The best way to put in place a sensible coordination of macroeconomic policies consists of enabling a multilateral institution to carry out that endeavor. That institution in principle already exists. It is the IMF, but its members would need to sensibly reinforce its surveillance authority and empower it with a much stronger mandate and the tools necessary to entice countries to deliver the policies consistent with the commonly agreed objectives of economic growth and financial stability. To be frank, such repowering of the IMF would be tantamount to a major overhaul of the global financial architecture. But the world, or more clearly its key powers, does not seem to be ready or willing for such an overhaul at this point. Nevertheless, the U20 must find a way to get out of the self-constructed trap of inefficacy and irrelevance into which it has been sliding. It needs to show to the international community and to its members' national constituencies that it can take important decisions that make a positive difference for each G20 country and the world at large. It should start by refocusing on the truly essential issues. In fact, just a subset consisting on those indispensably requiring collective agreement and action are of the highest urgency. I would like to think that the ongoing shakiness in financial markets and practically global economic weakening could provide a stimulus for the G20 to get serious and embark on an idiosyncratic agreement on macroeconomic policy coordination. I say idiosyncratic because, as I said, truly systemic reform doesn't seem to be in the cards anytime soon. It may be, but it is a few crises away. The idea would be to achieve from each key player policy packages coherent among themselves and of enough aggregate strength to generate a tie that would lift all boats. I would like to think that the synchronized slowdown that this time includes the second largest economy, China, the collapse in some key commodity prices and the volatile capital markets could materialize in an accord carrying some good policy teeth. The G20 meeting this year is in China and given that that country's GDP growth threatens to fall short of target, is suffering from financial volatility, capital flight, and a marked drop in its foreign exchange reserves, it would seem that that power's own interest is becoming well aligned with the other chief players' interest for macroeconomic policy coordination. For its own sake, China should try to exercise a constructive assertiveness to encourage its G20 partners to deliver on the promises made in years past. But I don't want to elaborate on this because if recent experience is any guide, right now I'm just doing some wishful thinking. Indeed, international cooperation is not having its finest hour. And this is true not only about economic governance, but also in almost every aspect that pertains to the multilateral system. It is certainly the case on the vital questions of peace and security. Over and over again, 
we have witnessed horrendous humanitarian crises stemming from interstate and intrastate conflicts that could have been at least mitigated, if not outright prevented, had the major powers agreed and acted in a concerted manner. Perhaps foolishly, I sometimes fall into the temptation of running a mental exercise, imagining what would have happened if the big powers had played more cooperative strategies in the key institutions. Just imagine if the United States of America and uh, its too willing and too few allies had seriously abided by the 2002 United Nations Security Council Resolution 1441. There would have been no invasion of Iraq in 2003 and a huge humanitarian, economic, and geopolitical cost, which is still accruing, would have been avoided. In reference to painful events of current concern, we can also speculate on what might have happened had the Security Council sent a precise message in October of, two, of 2011 or February 2012 to both the Syrian government and its armed opposition that the international community was united to prevent mass atrocity crimes and had seriously supported their own envoy at the time, my fellow elder Kofi Annan, to broker a ceasefire and negotiate an end to the conflict. Annan uh, had a six-point uh, plan that he had consulted with the main uh, players. Uh, Annan got uh, the Geneva communicate uh, of June uh, 2012, which was later betrayed by some of the key players, and of course, he resigned. But I have fallen too soon again into a subjunctive mood which is not terribly useful to deal with the harsh realities confronted by the international system. Absent of great redesigns anchored in shrewd grand bargains, the challenge is what to make of the existing system to advance solutions to the other pressing problems faced by the international community. In other words, we would want to explore the extent and the ways in which the existing instruments can be applied in the pursuit of those solutions. In some cases, it would be about existing understandings and covenants that being aimed at uh, highly desirable objectives actually lack the means to be effective. In these instances, the objective would consist of enhancing their effectiveness by means of suitable permutations and repowering within the general framework they allow. My earlier description of the G20 is a case in point, but there are many others, and I will span on a crucial one in a minute. But in other cases, it would be found that the internationally agreed rules not only fail to help solve a problem, but also flagrantly impede its solution, at times making it much worse. In those instances, a permutation of the system would do no good. Mutilation is what is needed. To illustrate the difference between the paths of permutation and mutilation of international regimes, allow me to make reference to two topics that are very much on the multilateral agenda these days. Reaching an agreement on the successor of the Kyoto Protocol was the motive for the recent 21st Conference of the Party, COP21, of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, whereas the problem of illicit drugs will be the subject of a United Nations General Assembly special session this April. The agreement achieved at the COP21 has been hailed as a significant success for the multilateral system. It is argued that uh, it is the first ever universal, legally binding climate deal among 195 countries. 
that is goals to limit the increase in global average temperature and the submission by countries of their national climate action plans, along with other provisions in the Paris Agreement, will put the world on track to avoid dangerous climate change. Although we all should be pleased that the Paris meeting reached an agreement and thus avoided the failure that was encountered at the Copenhagen COP of 2009, we should curb our enthusiasm about the capacity of, that the Paris Agreement may have to deliver its ultimate objective of sufficient climate change mitigation. A possible first step to temper expectations about the December Agreement could be to check whether it has overcome the problems that made the Kyoto Protocol so ineffective. Early skeptical observers of the Kyoto Protocol warned that it would be ineffective because it contained uh, obligations for only a limited number of signatories, not all of them, because it lacked the means to deter countries from not complying and because it lacked stipulations for substantial action to mitigate climate change. Those skeptics were proven right sooner rather than later, and definitely by the end of the 2008-2012 Kyoto budget period. Even a quick read of the Paris Agreement suggests that the new instrument may suffer essentially of the same shortcomings that plague its Kyoto predecessor. Although all countries in principle accepted obligations, unlike Kyoto, the text is full of nuances about flexibilities, voluntarism, and non-punitive mechanisms to promote compliance. Furthermore, each country's respective contributions to limit emissions would be nationally and therefore unilaterally determined. The Paris document itself, not with concern, and I quote, they say it very clearly, that the intended nationally determined contributions, the INDCs, fall short of what is needed to put global emissions on track to meet the goals. The Paris Agreement is not even constructed to ensure effective, not just nominal participation, adequate compliance, and sufficient aggregate emission reductions, all of which are necessary to achieve the purported climate change mitigation. In a nutshell, the agreement will not prevent free riding. Nevertheless, relative to the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement conceivably could represent a significant advancement towards the necessary effective mitigation regime. For one thing, it has given up the explicit global cap and trade approach that was instilled into Kyoto, a new feature that would make room to entertain alternative ways to pursue the necessary emission trajectories. Admittedly, an international cap and trade is still in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, but fortunately not rigorously spelled out. And its reporting and transparency provisions could also prove of enormous value down the road. My former politician intuition and knowledge of the theory of global public goods always made me a skeptical of the global cap and trade concept upon which Kyoto was anchored. Recently, my skepticism has been intellectually reinforced by the lucid work of scholars such as Marty Weitzman of Harvard and Bill Norhaus of my own university. In brief, and of course, at the risk of vulgarizing the rigorous argument, Weitzman and Norhaus conclude that negotiating a climate mitigation agreement of N emission quotas, if anything, will yield not only a suboptimal emission trajectory, but also that the coalition sustaining that agreement will tend to be unstable and prone to collapse, just as it happened with Kyoto. Norhaus and Weizmann, and now many others, including some who used to be firmly in the global cap and trade camp, suggest that the way to have a better chance of achieving a good international regime, meaning one uh, that could deliver in a sustained fashion the necessary global emissions trajectory, would be to have one 
in which the negotiating parties have the price of carbon as the sole focal point. This proposition has been further elaborated by Nordhaus, inspiring Buchanan's theory of clubs, arguing that what is needed is a coalition of countries coming together to negotiate the required carbon price. This coalition would be considerably smaller than the so-called universal participation of the Framework Convention, on, uh, and based on theoretical arguments and numerical simulations of his model, Nordhaus believes that a coalition coming together out of self-interest and perhaps a modicum of internationalist enlightenment would be robust enough to derive into a good reunion as I characterized it before. Frankly, I adhere to the Weizmann Nordhaus persuasion. Accordingly, my aspiration is to entice people like you to start thinking about a post-Paris arrangement that would commit the key players to a harmonized carbon pricing regime. A set of countries that would seem fit to form the initial carbon club would be those that are large emitters, their INDCs are consistent with a substantial domestic carbon price, and or the domestic externality is not hugely different from the global externality that they are causing with their respective uh, emissions. It seems to me that sooner rather than later, it will become evident that a significant enhancement of the regime agreed at Paris is indispensable if mitigation is to be undertaken seriously. Such an enhancement would not be a defection from the Paris Agreement, but an additional agreement. We have the Non-Proliferation Treaty and we have an additional protocol to the treaty, so we should have something like that. Uh, in the jargon that I used before, it would be a permutation of the regime that painstakingly has been in the process of being built since the Rio Conference of 92. Admittedly, the notion of clubs to address global issues departs from the ideal of universal multilateralism that many, including myself, would prefer. But a club operating effectively within a multilateral framework is better than a mechanism with universal participation devoid of any efficacy. I am afraid that multilaterally principled pluralism, like the club notion a la Norhaus for climate change or a la Robert Lawrence for trade issues, would prove the way to go if the system is to be empowered to deliver the goals collectively agreed. Unfortunately, not all of the existing multilateral agreements, if left unreformed, would accommodate such principled pluralism. A case in point is the multilateral framework to deal with the problem of so-called illicit drugs. As we all know, policies regarding these drugs have relied fundamentally on legal prohibition and its enforcement. It is safe to say that this approach is wholly inconsistent with best knowledge from the life sciences, sound public health research, and economic analysis. From what science knows about why people begin taking drugs and why some people even become addicted to drugs, it can be postulated safely that even if the best prevention strategies were applied, which unfortunately has never been the case, there would still be a residual demand for drugs, irrespective of whether they are prohibited or even highly priced in whatever market they are available. For its part, economic analysis demonstrates that prohibiting the production and consumption of any merchandise for which demand exists leads invariably to the creation of a black market by individuals and organizations willing to violate the law. And yet, for over a century, prohibition and its intended enforcement has prevailed as the preferred policy approach for dealing with the consumption of drugs. What is remarkable 
about the origin, spread, and prevalence of the prohibition and enforcement approach is how inconsistent it has proven to be, not only with best knowledge, but also with the results that such policy has actually delivered in practice. The faulty model, furthermore, has been enshrined in three United Nations conventions that frame national illicit drug regimes across the globe. Additionally, the United States has made a big point in its foreign policy to agree to a special enforcement mechanisms with countries considered key in the illicit traffic of drugs towards its own domestic market. As expected, since the prohibition and punitive model has failed to achieve its objectives in the US and in other highly developed countries, it is not the least surprising that the model's effects on countries with weaker institutions and fewer economic resources available to enforce the rule of law has proven to be not only ineffective, but actually disastrous. The human, institutional, and economic disaster caused by illegal drugs traffic, organized crime, will remain as long as there is not a fundamental revision of the international approach to drug policy. Tragically, this change is not yet clearly on the horizon, despite the opportunity to undertake such a revision that conceivably could be given this April with the convening of a special session of the General Assembly of the United Nations on the world drug problem known as UNGAS 2016. The Global Commission on Drug uh, Policy that, uh, other than myself, is formed by highly distinguished individuals, like uh, the former president of the Swiss Confederation, my dear friend Ruth Rifles, and Michel Kasatkin, uh, is there Michel? Uh, in our 2014 report, we express uh, the aspiration that the upcoming UNGAS 2016 be taken, and I quote, an unprecedented opportunity to review and redirect national drug control policies and the future of the global drug control regime. Unfortunately, that aspiration will be totally thwarted, or so it seems, as the preparatory process to the special session stands now. I regret to report to you that the latest draft of the document that would constitute the outcome of the UNGAS 2016 essentially reaffirms the permanence of the prohibition and punitive approach. It is tempting to say, paraphrasing the great Garcia Marquez, that the preparatory process of UNGAS 2016 has been a chronicle of a failure to reform for toll, if for none other than the simple reason that the countries opposed to serious reform have used their influence to practically predetermine their desired outcome. Defenders of the status quo claim that sufficient flexibility can be found within the conventions to pursue significant reform in drug policies. They point out, and rightly so, that the conventions can be interpreted as allowing the decriminalization of drug consumption. The problem is that the conventions essentially provide nil flexibility for any regulated supply of the same drugs whose consumption could, in principle, be decriminalized. Obviously, it would be inconsistent to decriminalize demand without taking supply out of the hands of criminal organizations. All other aspects being equal, demand liberalization alone would boost the illegal traffickers' revenues and thus their criminal power. It is for this reason that our global commission, while calling for an altogether end of criminalization of drug use, also proposes to reform that global drug policy regime so that governments can intelligently regulate drug markets. As we frankly express in the report, Ultimately, this is a choice between control in the hands of governments or control 
in the hands of gangsters. Make your own choice. If my worst fears about uh, the UNGAS 2016 are confirmed, I would then suggest, and this is not uh, discussed yet with my fellow commissioners, I would suggest then that mutilation of the existing international regime by defection from the conventions should be seriously considered by those countries willing and in need or pursuing seriously informed policy seriously informed by scientific knowledge. Dear friends of the Graduate Institute, there are more reasons today than there were just a few years ago to regret the patent inaction or even obstruction to reform some critical aspects of the international system. This is worrisome because the opportunity cost of such inaction, human and economic, is mounting. Conflicts taking hundreds of thousands of human lives and resulting in millions of refugees, quasi-stagnant developed and emerging economies regressing to the mean in their growth trajectory, globalization contained or retreating because its downsides are not addressed and its upsides are not tapped more decisively, the global uh, community's failure to adequately provide significant global public goods like climate change mitigation, and a stubborn attachment to expensive approaches to deal with some problems despite overwhelming evidence against their efficacy, are all challenges being hugely enlarged, although of course not solely caused by lack of serious commitment to enlighten international collective action. Ultimately, it will be up to political leaders to steer away from this dangerous course of action, but academic communities had much to contribute to the needed rectification. Those who think seriously about international relations must contribute to deepen our understanding of the political economy of international cooperation, and also explore formulas that would make it easier to circumvent the obstacles that so, ha so far had made the warranted collective action so elusive. Educating the future scholars and practitioners of these disciplines is equally critical for this endeavor. Mindful of its admirable research and educational history, I trust that the Geneva, Geneva Institute will continue to excel in the pursuit of such a crucial mission. Thank you. Seated or standing for the question? As, as you want. No, uh, no, you are the boss. Okay, maybe come sit with me, please. Okay. So we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes now for questions and answers. Uh, we've had really a complete tour d'horizon. We macroeconomic cooperation, trade cooperation, climate cooperation, cooperation or lack of cooperation on illegal drugs. Uh, please take the questions. Uh, the young man here in the front, please. Hello. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you mentioned that the current economic crisis, um, or at least its gravity, uh, might be due to a lack of uh, international macroeconomic coordination. Uh, could you develop, please, a little bit on this idea, maybe providing um, a couple of examples explaining why more macroeconomic coordination could uh, have made things better? Thank you. Yes, please, please, you, why don't you take this one? Well, thank you. Uh, well, first, as I said, you know, the case for macroeconomic policy coordination is uh, not always uh, evident for, for many people, but uh, I would say that under the present conditions, uh, it should be approaching uh, the evident case. Uh, imagine, let's say, let, let's start with some examples. Imagine that uh, 
China decides to have, uh, given the slowdown, uh, more expansive uh, policies and also starts to go for a much quicker uh, devaluation of its exchange rate. Uh, so I would like to think what will happen with other countries if China pursue, uh, let's say, a more aggressive uh, policy. I would assume that some countries will start to be worried, right? Let's take uh, the case of the United States. Let's say if the United States try to stimulate alone the global economy, then I suspect that something very much like uh, the global imbalances that we had uh, 10 years ago or so will start to emerge. And I could go one key player after the other and show you that rather sooner than later, uh, pursuing uh, a policy that seems to be in the self-interest uh, with the others not doing uh, something else will run into trouble. It seems to me that under the present conditions, and that is why I talk about an idiosyncratic agreement, it will be easier to get the uh, economies to a higher growth trajectory if there were a basic agreement on fiscal uh, monetary policy and, and even some modicum of rules about exchange rate policies. I think you can play with a lot of permutations, but it seems to me that right now we have the, the worst of uh, all worlds. Uh, and we are moving into a rather uh, difficult situation. Now, you want an example closer to home? Well, think about the European Monetary Union. I think basically what we have seen in the last few years, yes, uh, a big disaster was avoided, but uh, uh, what we have is a terribly a stagnant for practical purpose uh, European economy. And I think the problem has to do with the lack of internal macroeconomic policy coordination inside uh, the Union. I think if Germany had pursued, in agreement with the others, a more aggressive, uh, let's say, fiscal stance, eventually it would have been better for the others. And I would say better for, for Germany. So I agree, you know, that uh, not all the time, everywhere, uh, macroeconomic policy coordination would seem to be the best case. The other day I was talking with uh, David Mulford, you know, who nobody can accuse to be a, a progressive or, you know, economist. He was deputy secretary of the treasury with uh, Ronald Reagan at the time of Baker. And uh, even David Mulford, who is, you know, a true American uh, very centered in the U.S. interest, says, you know, I cannot believe that at the Plaza Agreement, we agree that the United States will raise taxes. Those were the times where we could talk about fiscal policy with other countries, or fiscal policy in the United States. Well, today it will be impossible. So I think there is something there. Please. Question over here on the right. Th thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, really fascinating presentation. I'd like to focus on some of the points you raised about the, the climate agreement. Uh, there were many issues there, but one uh, you talked about the clubs, uh, the, the approach of having clubs or the coalitions of the willing. And in reality, what we've seen is that these things don't work. There are clubs already. People have attempted to do this. The, uh, the G20 itself has failed to deal with climate change. Uh, the uh, major economies forum has failed to, to, to properly do this because many of the members who are parts of these don't want to deal with it other than in the multilateral. So my question is not just how we can make this work, but how can we lift up the climate discussions and relate them better to the global governance issues in other forums, whether it's the G20 or the global political, economic, security discussions, because it's still too, too isolated. So what would be your views on that? Thank you. Well, um, yes, I, 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 I agree with you that the G20 as a club failed. 
But I think the reason has failed uh, precisely has to do, among several other reasons, with the fact that rather sooner than later, they took up too many issues. You know, when they had their first meeting, and uh, then at London, and even still at Pittsburgh, it was basically a, a group to tackle four issues, which were financial reform of the domestic financial system, finan uh, reform of the uh, World Bank and the IMF, uh, preservation of open markets, and conclusion of the Doha round. I think they did a good job on the first, obviously not on the second, and macroeconomic policy coordination. Uh, what happened, you know, after Pittsburgh, uh, it became a tournament of including other issues. And I remember to have talked uh, about that with uh, Christine Lagarde when she was Minister of uh, Finance of France. I said, Christine, please don't allow your president to do what he's doing. You know, a universal consultation for people to suggest topics for the G20. I mean, this is going to destroy the G20. And even before France, it was Korea saying, oh, we must bring the development issues to the G20. And I was in Korea, I said to my Korean friends, this is a terrible mistake. There are other places to discuss uh, the development issues. Allow the G20 or force the G20 to deliver on what they have already committed. Uh, so, so that's one consideration. Uh, in the case of the idea of clubs that I think best developed uh, by, uh, by Bill Norhaus on climate, there is only one issue. It's climate change uh, mitigation. And uh, basically, I think it's uh, a good idea because we are approaching the point in which uh, countries that uh, whose domestic externality from climate change is similar to the global externality that they are causing are becoming rather similar. Think about China. I mean, China needs to do a lot on climate change for its own sake. So China is like a natural member, in fact, maybe the most uh, significant uh, you know, candidate. The US is a problem because uh, they, their domestic uh, externality uh, is well below than the global externality that they are causing. But they have done something. They have committed to certain targets by 2025. And if you run one of the climate change models, one of these uh, uh, general integrated, general equilibrium integrated models, then uh, if they want to get where they say they will get in 2025, they will need a very high carbon price, right? So that meets uh, another interesting criteria. The European Union, uh, the commitment they had made, actually they need a very high carbon price. So you start to have countries or group of countries that somehow uh, have already committed to a high carbon price. Maybe they have committed without thinking that they will comply. But let's assume they, they, they are taking their own targets, uh, domestic targets, seriously. Then I think you have serious candidates for this club. And of course, I don't want to go into the details of, uh, of uh, Norhaus' proposal because he has a big step that makes people like uh, uh, Bob and myself and like Fernando and Mateo and others who are linked to Trey here, very nervous, you know, because what Bill has said that uh, once you have the nucleus of the club, you can make others members of the club by imposing a, a common tariff on those who are, who, that are not members. And that's for us, you know, mentally is, still shocking uh, for me, you know. It's, but anyways, uh, I think th there is some value to the idea. But in any case, the conclusion is Paris was not so bad. I think it was good that it concluded, but if we are serious, we have to have an additional Paris rather sooner than later. <laughs>
Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive overview of a very complex situation. Uh, to step back and go to basics, uh, do you think our financial uh, system is still in a position to allocate resources efficiently across economies? Some statistics say that, for example, the combination of monetary, financial, and derivative instruments represent 13 times global GDP. So has actually the master become the slave? Well, you know, I, I, I haven't really studied uh, uh, the, the problem, but I know that very serious people, and not least like uh, people like Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, England uh, have said that uh, the financial system has grown too much. That the, let's say, the marginal social and economic value of the economic, um, of the financial system uh, is not simply there. And that probably it should be uh, smaller based on that grounds. I don't know whether that's uh, true because it's very hard to even think or attempt uh, reverse engineer. In a way, uh, you know, governments are attempting to do that when they say, okay, we are going to impose uh, much higher uh, capital requirements to uh, deceive the significantly, you know, important financial institutions. Maybe what they have in their mind is to make the system smaller. Uh, because uh, with much higher capital requirements, I think these institutions will have an option but to become smaller. Whether that's all you need to do for that objective, if you believe in the objective, I'm not uh, so sure. Uh, so I don't have a good answer for you, but I give a lot of credit to those who, who think uh, that uh, maybe the financial system in some parts of the world, which is the irony again, you know. Everything is poorly distributed in the world. There are countries that have a too small financial system, including my own, which even among Latin American countries, my country has a very small financial system, and then you have all these monsters in, in, in developed uh, countries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your frank commentary. Um, in the context of widespread violence and political impunity in Mexico, what would you think would be a solution to address the infiltration of the cartels in the political class and the police forces? Well, I think we are talking about two very important issues. On the one hand, my country has a very serious problem of rule of law, right? Uh, I was having uh, a, a meeting before this one with uh, Latin American students, and one of the students uh, said, what do you think is Mexico's uh, main problem? And I said, well, Mexico, to develop fully, I, I understood the question, has uh, three problems to overcome before we have the chance to be a fully developed country. Number one is rule of law. Number two is rule of law. And number three is rule of law. Because we have fixed a lot of other things, but everything else will not work as well as it should if we don't address with the same uh, decision uh, the question of rule of law. And many of these uh, terrible expressions that we are seeing in Mexico that you mentioned have to do with, uh, with the, our weak uh, rule of law. Now, having said that, having said that, let's look at the other problem. And that is the problem caused by organized crime, right? Uh, because I think uh, the problem of uh, lack of security, uh, right application of the law, uh, violence, crime, all of that, has been made much worse, and I would say many times worse, if not hundreds of times worse, by the presence of uh, organized crime. If we had a much stronger 
let's say, institutional uh, capacity to make uh, rule of law effective, the problem will be less, I would say yes, but not significantly. I mean, organized crime is such a cancer that it is capable of eroding even the strongest institution. Because they have a lot of money, and it's silver or lead. Make your own choice. And they have an enormous capacity to corrupt. And that is why I am terribly worried that we are moving very slowly on drug policy. Because we have created this monster. I mean, this is one, I call it in a little article I, I wrote at the end of the last year, you know, the, a big failure of civilization. Uh, how to deal with the drug problem. Because we know the basic, the two basics I mentioned, right? There will always be demand. And uh, if you prohibit supply, there will always be a bad person willing to fulfill that demand. So this was designed, engineered, by policy. This is very stupid. In two, three centuries, historians will be about, will be talking about us as uh, stupid people for too long apply this policy. And I am very sorry, but this is happening in my own country. Mm. I have a, I know a guy who makes estimates of how many people have been killed the last eight years in Mexico, and it's 100,000 people, right? Linked with organized crime. Of course, some frivolous people say, oh, but most of them were criminals. And I don't care. They were human beings, right? Uh, and, and they were killed because we have a stupid policy of prohibiting drugs of not regulating supply. And even worse for we very nationalistic Mexicans, that policy was imposed by the United States. So we are so nationalistic, we should tell our friends, listen, we need to change this. And from now on, I want to do my own policy. The one dictated by the doctors and by the economists, not by you. Thank you. Well, I think we've basically run out of time. So uh, if you wanted to make any kind of closing remarks, or we'll just wind up. But you, you've made your message very clear. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. But in any case, I just want to say thank you. It's great to be back. Thank you. Very much.